Hello and welcome to my lecture, Imagined Futures, the role of imagination and narratives in creating a post-corona economy. My name is Silja Graupe and I'm an economist and philosopher. Also, I'm vice president and co-founder of Kusanus University, which organizes this digital lecture series. Why are we doing this? Corona has a heavy impact on how we lead our lives and this in a global perspective. It brings about changes for good or for bad in just about every corner of this world. One of the most visible and tangible signs of it is that we have to keep social distancing, that we are separated from people we love and we want to interact with, and that we have to wear masks. One very concrete experience is um, that we as a university have been separated. We have been separated from our students for over half a year now and we all have been ended locked up in front of our computers. But as I see it, there's always a true chance to crisis. And also, although, as I've just said, um, there's an increase um, in visible and tangible social distancing, the chances have increased that we come aware of and pay more attention to the usual invisible forms of our interconnectedness. The coronavirus, as we now know, is transferred mostly by air. And it only takes less than 2.5 meters to transmit it from person to person. So imagine, it, just, it needs a very people being very closely physically interconnected and interacting in order to spread the virus. And at the same time, the virus was capable of spreading through the whole of the planet in a very, very short amount of time. It was just only weeks. And so we see um, by means of the virus that what we do in a very, very close um, interactions with our friends and our colleagues and with people we directly meet, that it's really interrelated with uh, what we do globally. And just imagine that we can stop a global pandemic by reinterpreting and reacting um, um, our closest interrelations. In Buddhism, there's a metaphor saying it's called Indra's net. And in Indra's net, it's a net of diamonds. And all these diamonds are mirroring each other so that each one um, is capable of reflecting the interconnectedness it has to all others. And I think uh, the corona pandemic can remind us that we are not just individuals trying to get goods or trying to achieve goals, that, but that the, as individuals, we are really connected to everyone um, in this world and also um, to the nature. Um, as we know, the virus has a lot to do, how we treat nature, how much room and space we give it, and if we just really intrude into ecological systems and um, that we create um, the problems associated with pandemic viruses. The main thesis of my talk is that it's of utmost importance um, that we are grow capable of imagining this form of interconnectedness. And to this thesis, there are two aspects which are of importance for my talk. I'm first uh, um, suggesting that interconnectedness is a real issue and that we have to be able uh, to, to visualize it, to imagine it and to conceptualize it. Um, and also that how we imagine is and how we conceptualize it is of utmost importance and how we think and act in the world. So as I said, two points, interconnectedness is really important as we can see in the corona pandemic. And second, that because it's so vast and because usually it's hidden from our awareness, the way we are capable of imagining is, is really um, very, very important, highly important, probably even most important in order to decide how we want to act in this interrelated world. My talk from now on is to proceed in four steps. First, I'll talk about shortly about imagination, about its role and um, how we imagine and the use, uh, how the use of words is very important in this. Um, second, I will then turn to neoliberalism and show how it's pushing us to imagine our interconnectedness in a very strange way 
it's a highly manipulated way um, and is, as I will argue, also a highly detrimental way. Um, third, I'll show that there's alternatives to this kind of imaginations neoliberalism is creating about our interconnectedness. And I'll try to lay out a roadmap of how we can change our imaginations and our creative cap capabilities of imagining um, in order to create different actions that stem from a different source compared to neoliberalism. And lastly, and very shortly, because I won't have so much time, um, I'll lay out what this all can mean um, in the midst of today's ongoing corona crisis. So let me now firstly talk about imagination, about its role in our society, and just to give a thought, philosophical and theoretical introduction of what imagination really is and the use um, of words uh, within this imagination. Um, and as you can uh, um, think, um, I really have to cut complicated issues uh, short here um, in, in order to make it possible to talk about difficult issues in very short amount of time. So if you look at economics as a, as a theory and as a subject, um, usually uh, the question of how social development is driven and how it goes about um, mainstream economics usually knows two different factors. Actually, the mainstream in itself usually knows one. Um, the mainstream of economics, uh, which I think of neoclassical economics in its mathematical forms, is thinking that economic development is driven by, uh, by kind of natural laws. This is that there are some objective laws that are independent of our human action and so that the chaotic experiences of um, our daily life is more kind of real or something that is just trying to hide reality, but reality behind it, it's kind of mechanical, logical and rational. And so to know those laws um, is to know um, how we can adapt to them and to know how the world how the world will proceed in the future. A second uh, thread in economic thought about thinking about social and economic development is by means of conventions. And this is also kind of out of the mainstream. It's about institutionalism, about the historic school, for example, and so on. And to think of that um, uh, economic development is driven by conventions is to think that it's dominated by the past and that it's dominated by historical development. So uh, if you follow this uh, thread of economic thought, you just think, well, it's about, uh, about history, and you always just look back in order to understand the present. And then you try to um, extrapolate it to the future. And these two different thoughts, threads of economic thought I'm not talking about today, but I want to introduce um, a new line of um, thinking within economic theory or sociological theory about the economy. And here the importance of imaginations um, it comes to the foreword. Um, what does it mean? Um, if we have an a, um, economy that is not just uh, real by chaotic life um, on the surface, and there's just and the thought that there's some natural laws behind it. If we really think um, that um, our present is dominated by what economists call real uncertainty, so that things are not known and the paths that the economy will take and individuals are going to take are unknown, then we talk about real uncertainty. And if there's real uncertainty, there's also creativity. So there's no way of talking about natural laws or even convention driving us. And the idea of imaginations driving the economy is that when the future is not um, certain, is truly uncertain, then people will create um, images of the future of how it will be and they will direct intentionally or unintentionally their actions toward those images. And these images are not in a sense, they're not illusionary, but they are also not in, in a sense of real, in the sense of objective, but they are real in the way of that, out of the concrete experiences of the present, people are forming um, uh, imaginations, how reality will develop in the future. 
And this is a creative monument in the present. And it's not just directed towards a given future, but it is creating future. And economic theory um, has usually um, just ignored uh, this part uh, of the economy. So there's even Keynes, for example, saying there are matters about which there's no scientific basis on which to form any calculable probability, whatever. We simply do not know. Nevertheless, the necessity for action and for decision compels us practical men um, to do our best to overlook this awkward fa fact. So even Keynes sees that there is true uncertainty. He tries that we should make a blind spot of it, that we should just ignore it as good as we can. Imagination is very different. It says it's actively dealing with this uncertainty, but as I said, forming pictures about the future, um, how it should, like, uh, should be like. Jens Beckert, it's a German um, a sociologist, defines imagined futures in the following way. He says, by fictions, I refer to images of some future state of the world or course of events, which are cognitively accessible in the present through mental representation. Fictionality in economic action is the inhabitation in the mind of an imagined future state, state of the world. Actors are motivated in the action by the imagined future state and organize the activities based on these mental representations. Since these representations are not confined to empirical reality, fictionality is also a source of creativity in the economy. Fictional expectations in the economy take narrative forms of stories, theories and discourses and, as I, as I will argue, really by concrete images in the sense of um, pictures, especially in our um, medial world of today. Now again, there are very different ways of talking about imaginations. And they have been uh, for a long time, especially in philosophy, but also in social um, theory, have been conceived in very different ways. And again, I just want to make complicated issues very short and want just to try uh, to bring to, atten to our attention uh, two kinds of how to conceptualize imaginations. One says um, that imagination is part of the human unconsciousness. Um, so it's part of um, our more emotional and unconscious um, part uh, of our um, human being and so that it really drives us to act. Yeah? So it's a, it's a active, imagination is active, but we have a passive stance towards our own mental representations. Um, so as Freud said, the ego is not master in its own house. Uh, and it seems that Im imaginations or Im um, yeah, imaginations drive um, our um, activities as human beings, but we are not to master them. And a second way, which I think is more um, is the better way to talk about it, is that imagination is, of course, one of the most important fundamental creative cap capacities we have as a human being. So uh, we can learn and should learn how to create Im our imaginations of to decide what kind of imagination means of mental representation of future states, especially we want to have and so can master um, what really drives us to action. And so I argue we are not slaves, but creators um, of, of imaginations. We are not consumers, but builders and shapers of imagination. This is a very, very long, a very old story in, in philosophical theory. For example, um, Nicolas Cousanos, uh, which is uh, the name giver of uh, my university, um, he um, already said in the Renaissance, or at the beginning of the Renaissance, that we are godlike um, in the capacity of creating our images. Yeah? So we are not consumers, but creators of our images. And that makes us to one of the most important creative beings in the world. And this, of course, as Nicolas Cousanos also says, comes a lot with a lot of um, responsibility, with a lot of moral questions, um, because if it's not just blindness uh, that creates images, we are responsible of how we use our creative capabilities as imagined, um, um, imaginative uh, creatures. And so if you take this responsible, if you take the creative capabilities and the responsible seriously, then it becomes, of course, 
um, a real issue of training, of giving knowledge about imaginations, of creating wisdom about it, especially in education. After we've seen that imagination is important and that we can ima um, imagine ourselves as um, imaginative creative beings and that imagination is one of the most important creative sources we have by which we can start, uh, shape our future, I just want to short, Mackley should want to make some short comments um, on how words are used um, within this creative power and um, I just make very short comments and then turn on how we visualize and imagine our interconnectedness in the world. Words and language is one of the most important creative tools we have in the use of imagination. Um, just imagine yourself sitting uh, at the breakfast table with your family or with your friends or just reading a newspaper and you can talk about everything in the world, about the coronaviruses and how it spreads in the world, how it affects you and you can communicate all this with words. And we know most of the inner dialogue within ourselves is also by words. So you can, can bring about every past, uh, present and future um, situation you can um, visualize by means of words. And within everyday language, uh, there's two different kinds of using words. Again, making complicated issues short. Um, so if you, if you use words, as, uh, for example, at the breakfast table, you say, could you please pass me the butter? Yeah, so use words that indicates, um, that indicates uh, objects, of daily objects, that you know how to use and you just remind someone else and they know what the butter is and they pass it to you because they think of, consciously, unconsciously, or they know that you want to spread the butter on your, on your piece of bread. Or you could also say, could you please borrow your pencil? And words are indicating something that is of interest in the real world, um, like because you want to write or you want to spread butter on your, on your, on your, on your bread. And as uh, Michel Pogliani and Harry Prosch says, um, that elementary use of language is found in the use of name to designate things, like particular persons or buildings they use as examples. You could also say so, butter or pencils. And the simple way of explaining how a particular name becomes attached to a particular personal object is to assume that it's the result of hearing the word spoken in the sight of the person or the building. So children learn to distinguish butter from a knife by just seeing how the parents use it and how they designate names to it. Here, it's important that words of interest are not of interest themselves, but they're used as indicated for something of interest and what is also important, uh, what uh, Pogliani and Prosch call that they are self-centered integrations so that you know that your whole person, you know that you're hungry, that you know that you want to have butter on your bread. Um, and then um, you as a person talk, um, you imagine yourself at the center of action and that's why they call a self-centered integration. So you're self-centered and you want to um, spread out uh, in activity to the world. And this is what I used, uh, words are used for. But there's also radical different usage of words and in which words do not function merely as indicators. And this is really, really important to understand the role of economic theory and the role of economic propaganda and so forth. Here the word do not point at something con concrete which they are dealing in diet practice, but they become a focal intention of it, um, themselves. So for example, consider the word freedom. It may some point to some direct experiences. So to free oneself from a clutch, for example, or to freeze um, out of an uncomfortable position. But as we use it in political speech, as I talked about later, like say it's the free market system, um, the word freedom functions in a very different way. It doesn't point at something. Uh, there's nothing you can focally attend to. You cannot bring something freedom or the free market system. But the word itself becomes focal interest in self and becomes loaded by meaning. So it's full of um, the meaning is put into the, the world and then you directly deal with the word, but not with the concrete experiences.
And in order to cre uh, create meaning out of a word such as freedom or like enduring freedom or political freedom or free America or whatever, um, we have to bring our diffuse experiences of being in independent, unrestricted, unenslaved in order to give the word meaning. So the word does not denote something meaningful, but you bring all your experiences um, to the word in order to make understanding of it. So freedom begins to stand for something to which we connect all our implicit knowledge, all our emotions, all our world with, all, all, all our worldviews. Um, and it, so it becomes to symbolize some otherwise inexplicable experience. As Polyani and Prosh uh, discuss, there's a true danger in this, um, that we are, when using words as sim symbols in the meaning I've just said, um, then that we are not self-centered anymore. So it's not us using the word of freedom, but that we have to bring ourselves into the word to bring our diffuse experiences as a living person in order to create meaning out of it. And Polyani and Prosh talk about surrendering ourselves, um, so making use of our whole personality in order to give words meaning. And this is also with uh, the truth for other political symbols, don't have to be words. They're talking, for example, about a flag and they say, but this means that the meaning of the flag, the object of our focal intention, is what it is because we have put our whole existence into it. Diffuse experiences in this of nation, of being a citizen and so on. And we have to surrender ourselves into that piece of cloth. It is only by virtue of our surrender to it that this piece of cloth becomes a flag and therefore becomes a symbol of our country. Yes, yeah, so, so um, it's not words are here used to instrumentalize our experiences, to load something up with meaning which does not direct on something concrete in experience. I now want to turn to the second part of my talk. And here I'm to show how neoliberalism does different things at the same time. I'm going to argue first that it snatches words by which we usually indicate objects of our daily usage. So we use words as indicators of something of interest in our daily life and then turns them into powerful symbols um, in two different ways. Uh, powerful symbols of our ignorance of interconnectedness and also using them um, in metaphorical combination to the myth of the free market system and those um, that uh, words denoting um, daily objects in our um, common usage um, are used, uh, become usable in political propaganda. And the best and most prominent example by which we can study this in detail, how neoliberalism uh, relates itself or makes us aware of interconnectedness, of our global interconnectedness, and at the same time um, elevates uh, our ignorance about this interconnectedness to something very good, and then to the free market system. And this can be studied in, in detail and very good by uh, turning to the essay written in 1953 uh, by Leonard um, Reed, who was the founder of the Foundation of Economic Education in the US. And this essay is called I Pencil. And this has been used for propaganda um, by uh, especially the Chicago School of Economics, especially by Milton Friedman. You can see if you go to the internet and you just uh, type in, in YouTube I Pencil, you can see a lot of talks, especially from Milton Friedman about it. And also um, neoliberal think tanks like the Competitive Enterprise Institute um, in the last couple of years have made films out of it that are used for schools and they have also altered it in iSmartphone and, and so on. So it's, it's a very popular thing and I want to reuse it to um, demonstrate how neoliberalism makes us uh, to think about our interconnectedness in a very weird and, as I would say, detrimental way. So listening uh, to um, Leonard Reed himself, um, he wants us that the pencil becomes um, like ordinary objects, like a pencil becomes symbols of moving us um, to, to action. He writes, if you can become aware of the miraculousness which I, the pencil, symbolize, 
Okay, so here is that the pencil is not uniting to something real. Could you please borrow me the pencil? But it's a symbol of a kind of miracle in the world. Um, and this miracle, it's not that you should just passively look at it and admire it, but it should drive you to action. So it should help you um, to save the freedom mankind is so unhappily losing. So it becomes part and parcel um, of an idea of activating people in, in, in the political sphere. And now um, I'm using the film by the Free Enterprise Attitude. You, can, you should just look at it in the whole, but I'm not allowed to show it here for legal reasons. So I've just made some screenshots to understand how this um, imagination um, works in, in case of neoliberalism and its uh, propagandistic parts. So the story of I pencil obviously is talking about a pencil. If you um, use pencils, you'd say, could I please borrow a pencil and I would pass you one because I know I, uh, I know you want to use it. And I know that you're an expert in, in the daily make usage of pencils. And so I, I would use the word and you would use the, no, uh, no, uh, the word in order to denote a field of experiences in which you are master. And uh, neoliberalism and uh, Leonard Reed and all those who follow them, they draw away focal attention from your um, field of mastery, from your skills, and thus, thus from all self-centered integrations. Uh, because usually you would know how to use pencils and you are self-centered, you're a person, and you're extending to the world in a kind of idea that you have a mastery of it. But neoliberalism is taking all this away from you and goes in a very different direction. It dissolves um, the, the identity you are using and with, the, with which you denote a word and a pencil to reality. And it's dissolving it and atomizing it. And it turns to, uh, pro, uh, attention not to the field of usage, but to the field of production. Obviously, it's the issue of all cultural techniques that we use, that we are able to make use of objects um, and in order to become masters of using them and at the same time that we do not know much about them. So we can, in cultural techniques, we can use things without knowing much about these. And this is just true for all cultural techniques, but here um, uh, neoliberalism takes to make a very powerful myth, myth of it and blocking and um, denying the reality in which this real interconnectedness um, of the pencil arises. After dissolving it, uh, they make us aware, which I think is a real, real good idea of neoliberalism. So it really makes us shortly aware of the whole interconnectedness. So if you think of a pencil, then you need wood, wood to produce it, graphite, uh, rubber and metal. And so if you use a pencil, as already um, Adam Smith said, um, using a different example, but it's basically the same. In today's world, we are literally collected to, uh, interconnected to millions and billions of people. And to make, this, uh, to make us aware of this, I think it's a very, very good idea. And it's also true in reality. But what is important is that neoliberalism never wants you to understand what really happens, but it's creating an image of it uh, that is said, well, you don't know anything and you don't really have to use anything and you're not, the interconnectedness should not um, inspire you to really uh, be curious what happens in the world, but just to uh, refer to stereotypes, um, how this uh, production was possible. And of course, to no surprise, knowing about a bit about neoliberalism, it gives you some just sort of very nice stereotypes of what production means. So if you look at this film, um, they make you to, um, uh, to bring and to understand what this production of the pencil means. Um, it uh, lures you to use um, peaceful images, for example, of the forest where the wood is created, um, images of control. Yeah, so there's a, a man capable of cutting down the tree within a peaceful nature. And this man brings in the images that is a sociable uh, and connectedness to, to our daily um, activities of eating and so on. So it's just 
Um, this is the power of symbols that is used here. So the pencil is not something you use anymore. Um, but if you are looking at the pencil, you should fill it with stereotypes of um, the interconnectedness that is created by means of production of, of producing uh, this pencil. And this is then turned into a, a idea of vastness, um, of the impossibility to uh, really know um, all those um, interconnectedness. So it's an idea of, well, it's somehow peaceful, but it's very, very vast um, indeed. Those I suppose that the trick of uh, neoliberalism is now obvious to you. Um, so here, um, words are not used to denote something out of your real um, uh, experiences. It's not to really think about our real interconnectedness. Um, instead, um, all true meaning um, that we know of in our daily lives, it's destroyed, it's dissolved, it's atomized. And the pencil or any other, other common drag is turned into a symbol in which we have to bring in um, our diffuse experiences of not really understanding um, of how things we use are really to come about and also diffuse experiences that this ignorance is um, embedded into something that beyond our knowledge is um, vast, um, intricate and also um, in uh, peaceful, controllable, sociable and, and so on. But this is not um, everything uh, what, um, uh, what neoliberalism does, but it's not taking the symbol of our ignorance and it's metaphorically linking it to a powerful um, idea, which is very prominent or has become very prominent economic thinking, it's the idea of the invisible hand. So if you look, if you may look at the screenshots again, the film, for example, takes lots of these pencils um, so all symbols of our ignorance and these um, are now formed together to create um, a, a, a hand and this hand is a, a metaphor for guidance, for godlike guidance, uh, for a trust in harmony and pro, um, providence. And so ignorance is now linked to the idea that ignorance is good and that you should not know anything about reality and about the real interconnectedness. So interconnectedness is not only um, connected to ignorance, but also to the idea that ignorance is good and it should even be, we should even be ignorant about the real circumstances of how the things we use come about. And here you can see in a second screenshot, um, it's really about um, bringing together this idea, the daily use, the daily symbol of the pencil with the idea of invisible hand. So every time we use things, we just reminded that everything behind our concrete knowledge should be turned towards something good, towards something peaceful, towards something, something harmonious. And they even go so far um, to say and to, to, to visualize and make our create imaginations that it's not only a fact that we don't know anything, but that we should surrender ourselves to this godlike guidance that is working behind um, the realm of our knowledge and that we not only can, but also should surrender ourselves like a child being picked up by his um, mother um, and, and brought to, to bed or, or carried somewhere else. This is not the end of the story because here it's just that ignorance of interconnectedness uh, is elevated to some godlike um, symbol. Um, but what neoliberalism now does that uh, it uh, connects a certain kind of interconnectedness in um, our daily lives to this um, idea of godlike providence. And you can see it uh, just an example. If you listen to Milton Friedman talking about um, I the pencil, I said, well, what's really behind it? It's just, just um, all kinds of interconnectedness, but it's the magic, as he calls, of the price system, the imp impersonal operations of prices, 
um, which brings people together to make them cooperate. Um, so the real miracle behind this is not just interconnectedness, but it's the very specific form of interconnectedness, uh, which happens by means of monetary um, exchange. And this monetary exchange now is directly linked now to the idea of harmony, peace and so on by linking these words together. So what really um, happens here uh, with our imagination is that on a surface level of um, words and uh, symbols, you're connecting, as I said, um, uh, a symbol of um, ignorance. Um, elevating it to something miraculous um, and, and great, which is the invisible hand, and you, using, making use of words like the free market system and so on, and linking it to the ideas uh, uh, makes you to bring diffuse experiences of harmony, of peace and so on, in order to make meaning of the symbol. And on a deep-seated level of diffuse and unconscious experiences, um, you say uh, you have to bring in your ideas of uh, changing things in a supermarket against money. Um, so here the free market is just uh, allures you to bring in your experiences just as consumers. And of course, if you're in a supermarket and if you buy uh, a pencil, as Friedman says, for a trifling sum, it's a very peaceful experience. It's a very powerful experience because everyone will give you a pencil in a supermarket if you have the money. Um, and there's all kinds of other interconnectedness, other kinds of sociability. They're included from free market experience itself. So um, neoliberalism makes you just to think of this kind of experiences and to blank everything up as um, out. And it makes you to surrender. Um, yourself and to bring in just this kind of experience in order to make sense um, of the symbol of the free market system. Yeah, so it's really um, a powerful network. So in, within this network, um, there's no way of really to um, interconnecting to people in other ways, but it's just uh, that um, your ignorance um, of true interconnectedness is uh, related to diffuse experiences of power as a consumer who has money and to diffuse experiences of states of harmony, peace and so on that you have to bring in from your experiences like experience of, um, of as a child of being brought to bed by your mother. This you all have to bring in um, to make the symbol work. And this is what Polanyi and Cross speak of. You have to surrender yourself to it. Now I'm coming to the third part uh, of my talk and I'll show you how we can become creative in order to alter our imaginations of interconnectedness and to really break out of this powerful um, image that neoliberalism has uh, created. Um, of course, uh, part of the very powerful images is uh, said that, um, as I said, you do not need to know something about the world that uh, neoliberalism allows us to be lazy, to really refrain from thinking and from really looking uh, at things how they really uh, are. And also, there's been a powerful talk now for 40, 50, 60 or even 70 years um, of the idea that there is no alternative. Yeah, so Tina, uh, uh, the Tina argument, there is no uh, alternative. And obviously, if you just surrender yourself and we surrender ourselves to this symbol of the free market system, then there is actually no alternative. So what we really have to do is to um, get out of this idea that this image is the, Im the image of the free market system can be implanted in ourselves and that we have to unconsciously um, obey, obey it in, because it's the driver um, of our actions and of our conscious thought, but really have, in the sense of Nicolaus von Kuhs, as I said before, really become creators of our own images and try to um, alter our imagination so that we can become aware of interconnectedness and global interconnectedness in a different way. So I would say, um, Tina, no, um, there are alternatives. And these alternatives are not just to um, link to real action, 
but also to real alternatives of our imaginative powers. In the amount of time uh, given to my talk today, I now just want to shortly sh um, sketch out a possible roadmap to new kind of imagined futures. And I, I just uh, shortly or roughly will proceed in different steps in order to show uh, how we can use, make use of our creative facu facultures of imagination in order to bring about a change. So first, um, I would say that a good idea of uh, neoliberalism is that it starts with some kind of awareness of ordinary life and its common objects. So if you think about neoclassical theory, if you sit in a mainstream economics lecture, introductory lecture, they are not talking about ordinary life, but they are talking about mathematical formulas. So really to start economic thinking by linking it to our ordinary life and to our common objects. So using this as the starting point as already Marshall, um, Alfred Marshall said, I think it's a very good idea. And um, also it's a very good idea um, to start with an idea of interconnectedness, but I, as I go to show now, we should conceive it in a very different way. So my second step was say, let's reframe from fostering ignorance um, of the web of interconnectedness, um, which does neoliberalism and let's excite the quest for knowledge instead. So this is one of the most important steps to break, break free from um, a propagandistic use, usage of symbols and it's the power of stop and think yeah so you really have to say well where does where are things going wrong here and in neoliberalism things are going wrong it makes you aware of the global net of interconnectedness which is a very good idea to ask how is my pencil produced in the first place how does it interconnect me to, to other people but instead of um elevating our ignorance to some sort of good thing in, in, a, in a political system, we should excite really knowledge and say, well, let's look, how are, how are these things produced? Um, so the idea is here that we just use a normal daily object like a pencil and to say, well, to whom's life I am really connected? And neoliberalism would answer, well, you cannot really know because it's so complicated. And this is obviously true, um, that we cannot know um, every detail. Um, but we can use symbols in a very different way as is used by neoliberal propaganda. And I, I refer here to the tradition of um, uh, pragmatism and say, well, um, we can have symbols, but we are not surrendering ourselves, but we're using symbols so that they do not turn away from experiences or make use of diffuse experiences, but highlight experiences we think are worthwhile of intention. So it's not that you have to know everything about a pencil, but to think about experiences within the production process and to say, how can I create a symbol so that it resonates with other experiences? So the idea is, uh, or, or the alternative to political propaganda and symbols used in them, like the flag or the free market system or whatever, the invisible hand is not that you have to rationally know everything, but that you create symbols that are resonating with the experiences that you think or we think is worthwhile of highlighting. Um, so it's, uh, and for me, these are symbols uh, that uh, do not appeal to our ignorance, uh, but that appeal to um, uh, feelings of solidarity, of empathy, and so on. Yeah, so to di redirect it, so that we can understand the world and how we are connectedness by using very, very different faculties of, of our emotional and imaginative capacities. And I think that a, a very, very uh, important difference uh, to neoliberalism and their way they're using symbols is um, that we should make use of symbols in order to indicate of our, how, of our use of common objects is linked to real suffering of other people. So not just to automatically think of harmony and uh, without checking if it's really harmonious, but really open up ourselves to say, how is my life connected to the suffering and to the problems of other people? So for example, you could use the pencils family tree to see well, or just to awaken to the fact or just to use it in education, say, 
well if you have a pencil there's graphite in it um, as for example in smartphones and to really get an interest and say how is this uh, graphite really produced and then you should could uh, go to uh, to newspapers or to other media and to find out how um, graphite for example is mined and as I show here there's uh, symbols for it pictures for it you can really say that it's um, graphite it's not just uh, about a peaceful uh, forest where a single tree is cut as shown in neoliberal propaganda but here it's about uh, graphite mining that is just uh, severe interruptions into the um, eco um, ecosystem and also brings a lot of um, uh, problems to, to people's life um, in the surrounding of these um, mining uh, places. So here, the power is of your words and of symbols and images to really remind um, of problematic um, incidences. Um, and so not just to look away, uh, but to look closer. And as I said, it's not that you have to know knowledge about everything that happens there, but to get an idea of a sense uh, of suffering and wrong wrongness. The next step would be to create narratives of the suffering. So as pragmatism and especially like people like Richard Sennett say, so how can we create narratives of the suffering so it resonates with our own experience of suffering? So that we have an idea of being interconnected uh, to people um, on, a, on a very uh, concrete, not diffuse, but a very concrete idea of experiences. And here, for example, I have a picture is taken out of an article from the Washington Post, which really uh, explored into what happens in the context of graphite mining. And here it's a story of, of a couple uh, that's living near uh, a, a graphite, graphite mine. And uh, they have detected that all their trees from which they are living, all their crops are just dying. Yeah? So, so there's a clear uh, connectedness to a story that everyone can um, relate to out of real experiences what would happen in my context if the all all trees would be dying if there would no be crop if uh, there will be hunger because um, people cannot feed themselves anymore so it's just an example it's not just rational knowledge but to create images of problems of wrongness um, in our uh, in in lives and show that they are directly connected, uh, interconnected to what we do um, in our world, in our daily lives. So here's um, that we get an idea of interconnectedness, um, but we are linking to, to problematic aspects, to suffering. There was opening up faculties of empathy, of, um, uh, of, uh, of goodwill um, and so on. But this obviously is not enough because then um, it would um, we would not be like uh, related to ignorance, which is quite true. Um, but it would just open our way up to see well everything is so difficult and everything is so um, possibly uh, wrong and disharmonious that uh, the, the the danger would be that we're just getting in a kind of um, state where where we think we cannot do anything and we just uh, uh, passively watching um, the badness of this world. So here in comes now the, the role, as I would argue, of imaged, uh, imagined futures. Um, and real imagined futures say, so if we have this narratives of concrete suffering in this world, how would um, the, the, uh, the future look like in which this suffering will be alleviated or even abolished? And this is where we really have to be creative and really imagine a future state um, in which the suffering would be gone in a very, very concrete way. So here I use also an image of the uh, Washington Post article and say, well, here it's a, it's a, it's a um, idea of the future that is based on a past where these people were free of this graphite mines and could grow uh, their crops, could grow their rice, and um, so could be able to feed themselves. And we say, well, the future should be 
that I could use my pencil in a way that others uh, can at least um, eat and feed themselves and have a livable existence. Um, but imagine futures can be different because it can also be states that are not uh, referring to the past, but uh, to states uh, that have never been in place uh, before. So really creating new images of um, things and states that have never been occurred before. The next step or next possible step would be to link these positive images of the future to experiences of action we can take. I think that's very important. It's not just to uh, resonate with experiences um, of uh, people suffering from the interconnectedness they have to our action, but to create an image that we want to achieve and to link this image, this future, imagined future, to experiences of actions we can take. Um, otherwise, um, we can become aware of interconnectedness, but we cannot create imagine, um, imaginations of action. And as I said, neoliberalism, what it tries is to create a powerful symbol for in inaction, that you should not take any action except for uh, dealing with prices, just buying goods. And so I think that's really, really important um, that um, we create images and an idea and against narratives and symbols of actions that we can take. And just, just as examples, it's just uh, to, uh, foster creativity here, you can link it, for example, to um, consumer boycotts and say, well, if there is a production, for example, of pencils um, that uh, is detrimental to people and suffering, for example, in the surrounding of Graffert uh, mining places, um, then we just don't, we refrain it from buying. So you're not, uh, you're still a consumer. Um, but we create images now that is uh, uh, that are creating awareness of the power of us as consumers. The other thing would be is to say, well, if I'm interconnected uh, to all other people, then out of uh, gratefulness and out of seeing that I create suffering by using things within a capitalist system, I will use them in a very careful manner. So, for example, um, the story, I don't know if of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, that he always used um, his pencil until the very, very end. And I don't know what's in English, but showing on, uh, to the right hand corner, uh, the bottom right hand corner, um, there's also um, really daily common objects we can create. Um, it's called Stiftverlängerung in German, um, so that you can use to take very, very small, the rest of, of pencils, uh, put it in something longer um, that is durable, and so you can reuse it again and again, and you can use every pencil until the very end. And this could be a, become a powerful idea of really not wasting things because of our awareness of our connectedness to nature, to the trees that have to be cut down, and to the possible suffering um, of people. And also it could be that we create um, other forms of interconnectedness, for example, by banning slave, uh, child labor, by banning environmental uh, destruction, and to create symbols out of it, uh, like all these fair trade labels and so on, and to really see that these labels are not just um, symbols by which you can uh, cheat uh, consumers, but really to see how can they symbolizing a better way of global interconnectedness by means of production in these cases. Here now we have an idea of how our experiences are not just only related to the suffering of people, but also to the uh, elimination of suffering or trying to create a world in a different kind of, of reaction. And it should always be uh, in a way that it can be linked to the actions we can take. And lastly, let's say, um, let's create a new language um, and making use um, of language in a way that it indicates real problems, which is not really um, an, an easy issue because we have uh, lots of epistemic violence, especially created by neoliberal theory and propaganda 
that reveals um, problems so they cannot be art articulated anymore. So if you, for example, uh, study a mainstream economic course, you're not given the power of expressing the problems that are of importance in this world. And the second is to use language to symbolize the interrelatedness of our experiences and to imagine positive futures and path of transformative actions. So not just as I did working with like pictures, but creating a whole language of expressing problems, of symbolizing um, what really interrelates us and then to imagine positive futures and path of transformative action. Let me now come to the last part um, of my talk and let me shortly indicate of how this can help us in the midst of the today's ongoing um, corona crisis. Um, as I said, as I started my, 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 my lecture today, um, the corona crisis has the capability of making us aware of global interconnectedness. And it's a very, very specific form because the coronavirus is spread, as I said, because of very, very close um, interpersonal interaction and communication. And at the same time, because we are all globally interconnected, these face-to-face -face interactions have um, uh, are, re are relating us to all other people in the world. And in our today's interconnected, especially capitalistic interconnected world, um, we can spread the way we interact as persons um, to a whole global network. And so the idea would be now to see, well, uh, this crisis has um, created or has uh, allowed to create new daily common objects. And I've shown you one here, um, which is the masks we have all to wear now. And I think it's a more becoming a real global phenomenon. And here, uh, what I want to do in future and also to talk about with students and to uh, get into dialogue with, uh, with you, how we can turn it into a powerful symbol of true interconnectedness. And so what kind of suffering it is related to, it's to the suffering of the people being sick or even dying of COVID-19, but also to the people in the lockdown who are not able to feed uh, their families anymore. It's uh, linked to experiences uh, of um, of unemployment and to really see so what is the kind of interconnectedness um, it shows and then again to find ways um, how can we alleviate it and it's really now yet yeah, now thinking about how it, it changes our daily lives uh, what can be taken out of it and then to see what actions uh, we can take uh, to alleviate it. And for me, this is not something we have accomplished um, already. Always say, well, there, there's a fixed idea of how to, to do it. But I, what I've tried to show is that in, in order to start all this, we really, really have to refrain from those powerful symbols of neoliberalism, which um, tries us to um, become uh, confident in our own ignorance of elevating ignorance about human suffering and the suffering of nature uh, to something positive and to then automatically think of the price system as something um, harmonious, voluntary, peaceful and so on. So we really have to break through it and we have to really open ourselves up to the suffering of ourselves and to other people and to find language, to find signs and symbols of resonating um, experiences which we do not want to cope with uh, in our world anymore and then find images of actions uh, we can take in a daily basis. So what happens is that language and symbols and our powers of imagining new futures can help us uh, to really find new ways um, of altering our uh, global interconnectedness towards something which is really and not just supposedly different and uh, which should bring more peace and more harmony to this world. Thank you.